Welcome to the ANR Communicators meeting. We are going to get started in just a few minutes. Yeah, I'm going to wait one minute for a few more people to log on. Okay. <clears throat> Is Carla joining us, Sally? Sorry, struggled with the unmute button. Um, <laughs> uh, she will not be uh, joining us today, just, just me today. Okie dokie. I know, bummer. All right, it's 10 01, so I'll go ahead and start. So, we are very fortunate to have Sally Poggi with us today from UC Davis. She is the Director of Social Media for Strategic Communications there. And I had the pleasure of working with her for, I'd say, maybe five years, four years. Time flies. <laughs> uh, something like that. <laughs> so, um, and I, so I got to see firsthand um, what an expert um, strategist she is for social media, and she's just done amazing things with the team there. And she is going to share some tips and tricks related to um, metrics, using metrics to understand and advance your social media initiatives. So with that, I will hand it over to Sally. Thanks so much again for joining us. Oh my gosh, such a pleasure, Linda. Always nice to hang out with the UCA and our crew. Um, lots of really good uh, peeps in here, so it's it's nice to see um, everybody again. Um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start with sharing my screen. So give me just a second to make sure. Got that going. Hmm. Okay, let's try that. Let's share that screen, here we go. And I've got a little presentation and then I'm really hoping that we can um, really focus on um, getting some questions in because these things just are so much better when you can ask questions. Um, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. yes? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. All right. So um, I'm calling this kind of a little bit of a social media 2.0. So um, today we're going to be really covering how to take a look at your data, get familiar, get comfortable, um, build a relationship, if you will, with your data, and then how to apply that to strategy and social media content um, moving forward. So that's what we're really going to be focusing on today. Um, it's a little hard to go into all of the nitty gritty with each and every platform, but we are going to take a look at a couple. So um, let's just dig right in. And the other thing is I want people to kind of like if I'm going too fast or if you have a question, please don't hesitate to speak up and ask the question because if you're thinking that, I guarantee you other people are thinking that as well. Okay. So uh, here we go. So oh, that's just a little bit about me. Um, like Linda said, Director of Social Media here at UC Davis. Um, we look at the community as a whole across campus. And then I have a, a team of four other people who um, are responsible for the flagship social media channels at UC Davis, the um, executive social media channels for Chancellor May, and also undergrad admissions is under our, uh, my purview as well. So we're looking at about 24 different channels that we're uh, managing and operating at any one time. Um, but really, we're here to serve our community, and that also includes our colleagues here at UC AMR. Um, we're here to help. So there's my email, and I'll show it again at the end, um, because this is a journey, and this is an evolution, and we're always learning something new. So um, we welcome you into that community. Um, <clears throat> also, I'm a self-taught data nerd. So just so you know, I've learned this from many years of trial and error. I don't have it perfectly. There's maybe a question that I may not be able to answer, but I'm willing to go explore that with you. Um, in the social media life cycle, just to kind of set the stage for a conversation today, um, we're really uh, going to be focusing on the measuring part of the life cycle. So um, when we think about how we approach content on all of these different channels, 
we're constantly going around this wheel. We're always listening and evaluating. That's a big part of measuring too. We're setting our goals. We're doing our, our strategy. Then we're engaging with our audience and then we're always measuring that engagement and then back around the circle we go. It's um, kind of a continuous thing, but what we're really focusing on how and what to measure, that's gonna be really important, how to measure it and then like how to apply it to you know your content strategy and how you engage. <clears throat> so real quickly, um, social media data can um, really help you to refine your strategy. Um, are you using the right channels or not? We can use data to make some of those decisions. Do we start a new one? Do we sunset, sunset a channel? These are all questions that we're constantly asking. It can help you to optimize content. And when I'm talking about optimizing content, that is, do I use a picture? Do I use a video? Do I increase the length? Do I decrease the length? Do I use these words? I mean, there's a million micro decisions within social media content and looking at your data can really help you refine this. I mean, it really also helps you understand your audience and the community that you're trying to build, which is arguably the most important thing in social media building. It's less about what you wanna say and more about how your audience is reacting and the value that you're bringing to them. And data can really help you answer some questions. Um, it can also help you measure impact. So if you are arguing for more resources, if you're making the decisions about where resources are going um, amongst the communication disciplines, um, this can help you understand like what the time that you're putting into social media, what is the impact that you're actually having or how many clicks are you driving or are you getting event registration, whatever it is that your goal is, data is gonna help you start understanding how you're progressing towards that goal. Um, and honestly, in my opinion, if you are not using your data, then you're just another person with an opinion and maybe a well-educated opinion, but the data can really help you drive that story home. So today, what we're really going to work on is um, <clears throat> there's a lot of different kinds of social media data out there. But today, for today's purposes, we're really only going to look at organic data. So that means we're not looking at ad data you know, you boost a post on Facebook, that comes with a whole set of, of um, stats. We're not really gonna focus on that today. So when I mean organic, it just means like if you put up a post without any ad spend, what does that look like? What does that data look like? Um, a lot of the principles apply, but for today's purposes, organic only. We're really gonna focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram data today. And you'll see that uh, some of the language um, applies. So if you can get kind of familiar with these platforms, it really applies across, you know, if you're on LinkedIn or I don't know, if somebody's doing something edgy on TikTok, like it kind of applies across the board. Um, but we're gonna take a little bit deeper dive on these three platforms. And then we're really focusing on our internal data, not our external data. So we're not looking at anytime anybody mentions UCANR out in the wilds, there's a whole other set of data that you could start looking at once you, but right now what we're looking at is the data that we have generated from our posts and our content that we, and our efforts. Does every, so just setting that kind of um, understanding, because um, again, with data, you can, you can measure a gazillion things. So right now we're trying to focus it in a little bit. <clears throat> and then a couple quick uh, principles about social media data. So the first is that there is a seven day time lag in the data. So if you wanna pull data, you gotta think kind of a week in the past. Um, sometimes you can see, you, obviously you can see data rolling in as you like first post something and you kind of see you know, oh, everybody's reacting to this, or they really love this post with this cat or whatever it is. You can kind of see that in real time. But if you really wanna start making big data um, pulls, you have to think that it's gonna take about seven days for it to get out of people's feeds and for those kind of final numbers to come in. So when somebody asks us to quickly pull metrics for something, we always do it with a little asterisk and say like, hey, things are still rolling. So these numbers will change. Um, and if you're gonna do like monthly metrics, you always need to do it like a week after the month has closed because that just gives the data and the posts some time to settle, okay? So that's first. Um, second, you can measure a lot of things. If you've ever pulled a, a Facebook data Excel export, 
there's like a million tabs and a million calls. Like you can just go crazy with it. What we're going to talk about today is um, focusing and really finding the things that are important amongst that huge thing. But on the flip side of that, sometimes we, uh, especially from leadership, people will anticipate that because you can measure all these things, you can measure everything. And there is a limit to social media data. And those questions often come with um, uh, data, data around audience demographics. Okay, so some people are like, well, I wanna know how many people are UC Davis students that live in, in Davis and Sacramento region who are on our Facebook page. And I'm like, hey, I have some general demographics, but I can't get specific and talk about, you know, all of those tiny little nitty gritty things because there are data privacy rules, especially around individuals and IP addresses. So there's limits, but we still can measure quite a bit. <clears throat> okay, third, native is best. Exports are the most accurate. So when I mean native, the best thing to do is to go within the platform, twitter.com, and look at your metrics within that environment. It's going to be the most accurate. You're gonna have the best understanding with it. You can use other tools and platforms, but to get really comfortable with it, we really recommend looking at the native, going within the actual app or the website and looking at the data within that environment. Um, build a relationship with your data. I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but like the more comfortable and the more frequent that you are with looking at your data, you're going to understand it and, and feel more comfortable and confident um, interpreting it. And then just buckle up, folks. This is a bit of a marathon. So the biggest uh, uh, thing with data is consistency, doing it regularly, making it a habit. Like you brush your teeth, you take five minutes to open up and look at your data for the day, okay? And so that building that consistency is gonna really help you um, understand and interpret it. Also, looking at tiny little data chunks is really difficult. Looking at big swaths of data over time is really what's gonna deliver those insights that you're looking for. Like, what time of day are people interacting with my posts? I have to look at a big chunk of time um, period to understand if there are trends. And I'm going to show you some of this, okay? So here we go. Everybody ready? Let's dive in. Let's do it. Okay. Let's talk about what me measuring what actually counts. So again, in social media data, you can measure like every little click, every little hover. Some of that is just really not necessary. So let's get rid of that chaff, if you will. Um, what we're really looking for are these kind of different categories of kinds of data. So the first is around content performance. I post a video, I post a photo, I post an Instagram post. How is that piece of content really performing? Is it getting liked? Is it getting commented? Is it getting shared on? Is it getting um, screenshotted? All of those kinds of things um, are, are, are an indicator of how the post or the piece of content is performing. Okay, so that's one chunk of kind of data that we can look at. The next is audience demographics. Again, some limitations here, remember privacy issues. However, we can sometimes look at location, um, generally location, um, a general age brackets. Um, so we can understand, is our audience actually older than what we think it is? Um, this has happened to us on Facebook. We thought we were talking over here to this age group. Oh my gosh, it's actually moved over the past couple of years. We have a much older age demographic than we thought. We need to cater our content to this per part of a person's life versus this part, right? Okay, so that can give us some indications. Gender, gender is also very fluid, remember? So on social media, they'll classify as male or female, but there's a lot in between there. So we take that one with big grain of salt. And socioeconomic status. Um, Twitter will actually give you household, uh, estimated household income. So um, same thing with uh, LinkedIn. So it can give you some clues, but everything has to be taken with grain of salt. And then community size and impact. So how big is your community? Those are your, how many fans you have, or what's the sentiment? Are they negative comments? Are they positive comments? Again, more data points to look at. And what's our relationship with our competitors? Like, are we at the same scale as maybe our competitive groups are or somebody that we look up to? So again, all data points that we can look at. But let's talk about value now. So those are all the kind of pieces that we're looking at. And again, we're gonna continue to drill down and get more granular as this presentation goes along. But let's also talk about the importance because let's face it, 
uh, an impression is not quite as valuable as a share. So there's value, um, a lens that goes on this as well. So let's talk about that funnel. So the first is an impression. This is the amount of times somebody has seen a piece of content. Their eyeballs have looked at your piece of content. That's an impression, okay? Um, it could be multiple times. It could be multiple sets of eyeballs, okay? Sorry, I put eyeballs in there. I guess that's kind of weird, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, next is reach. Now, reach is a little bit smaller than impressions because it actually looks at the unique pairs of eyeballs, okay? So I could, if you're thinking about this, um, maybe as if it was like a billboard, I drive down I-5, I see that billboard two times every day. Um, that will be counted as two impressions, right, for that day, for that time period. But if I was to be, if I'm looking at reach, it would only be counted as one, and that's because I've seen it only one person has seen it, okay? All right, moving down the value funnel is next our community size. So remember, we're, it's gonna be bigger in volume, but it's kind of, now we're getting to what's really important. <clears throat> Fan size, so number of people who have opted in to, to follow your community. Important number to track, is it the best and most important number? No, it's not, but still important in your story. Um, next is engagements. So we kind of think of engagements as there are passive engagements and then there are active engagements. So that's that green trial goal and we're gonna get there. So we think of engagement in social media terms as any click, click to play, link, they click on the link, they DM us, they comment, they like, any of those are considered an engagement. However, I would argue that if someone is going to uh, like or comment or share that with their community, that's a much more engaged, that's a much more active engagement versus just clicking on a link, right? So um, that's why we kind of extract that even further into that last uh, green kind of um, triangle, if you will, at the end of the funnel. So that is where we're really seeing if somebody's taking an action to communicate with us, to share it amongst their community, that is the social media distilled gold, okay? So we have to look at all these numbers in relation to each other because, you know, the more people that see it, the more people who are going to have an opportunity to engage with it. But when it comes to looking at like where we're best performing, we're constantly looking at that those numbers at the very bottom and they are the smallest numbers as well um, in in terms of the context of what's important okay any questions here before i like kind of move on okay i had a quick question oh yes uh, the volume and the value era mm -hmm. what what are those i mean what can you just kind of real quick of course. I mean, I get it. The volume, I get the volume one. The value one, I guess it's because you, you're saying that those are your most valuable, not value of the person, not, not value by the, the person using it. It's value to us. I, right? I would argue both. Okay. I would argue both, Karen, because um, the when somebody is on social media and they choose to share one of your posts with their community, that is the most, uh, that is an action for them that actually takes their reputation and attaches it to, to your whatever post right, that okay. you're posting. Yeah. So for them, no, right. that, yeah. that shows that they have, they see value in that content and they're going to go ahead and share it with their community. That has the greatest value. I mean, that's right. their value action. And then for us, that's what we're looking for because it shows that we've matched our mission with their need. And that's the most value, valuable piece of content. In terms of volume, just less people take those actions, right? Than right, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, okay so it. now I'm going to actually show you where the data sources are, and then we're going to show you how to kind of like look for these things within social media data. Quickly, we have a question in chat, if you don't mind, before yes, we get into data. Yeah, thank you. How do we achieve good impressions to catch people's eyeballs? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's going to come with strategy. So let's put a pin on that one because we will address it. That's a great question. Because it is a game. Like, like you have to have enough out there for people to react to, right? So um, that's part of the strategy. So again, we're going to start drilling down to strategy here in a second. But let me show you where to get this data, okay? Data sources. This will be a pretty short section, okay? Um, there's three different kinds of data, kind of, again, we've talked about demographic data, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but I will show you where to get it. Um, there's, a, there's some nuances with social media data. There's page data, which means, what's the action going on on my Facebook page? Okay, so somebody maybe just comes to the profile or they like the page or they are scrolling up and down within the feed, but maybe they aren't interacting with a piece of content. That's a different set of information and data that Facebook kind of extracts out. And that will tell you like, what are your follower counts? And you know, what is the action just on your profile? Then you've got very specific post data. And that means your social media posts individually extracted from that data so that they can tell you this post on October 15th, you know, generated this much reach, this much impressions, this much, you know, engagements. And then now you can look at it by post. But arguably, if you want to be tracking how many fans you get and everything, you need to be looking at both sets of data. Okay. Um, and then user data is, again, limited demographic data good to look at, but you're not going to be looking at that all the time. That That's something you look at like maybe once or twice a year, okay? Now, unfortunately, <laughs> the reason why this is so complicated and so many folks get, um, it takes a lot of time to get comfortable with this, is that everybody has their own language, you know? Nobody was like, here's the standard language guide to all these platforms, platforms making their social media data. So everybody has different things that they call it. Facebook calls it insights um, because Facebook owns Instagram. They also call that insights. Twitter is a little bit more blunt. They call it analytics. Um, LinkedIn, I think, calls it performance. Like there's just like silly language across across platforms. Um, <clears throat> they each also offer their own formats, which is royally annoying, but we get start to get comfortable with it. So there's exports available. However, on Instagram, there are no exports available. You have to kind of do it on mobile by hand. It's really annoying. And I'm going to show you some short, shortcuts for that. Um, and then they will give you different kinds of um, data. So I'm going to just show you what that looks like. Okay. So on Facebook, <clears throat> if you go to your uh, Facebook business, your page, um, you'll see uh, where that little arrow is. That's where um, they have moved the menu. I had to take all new screenshots for this because they just changed everything a couple of weeks ago. Um, <laughs> they've moved the menu item to this uh, like left-hand column and you'll see the little graph with the insights. And if you click on that, you will be taken to this location. And actually I'm going to quickly jump out, actually, you know what? Hold on. Sorry, I'm changing my mind here. I'm going to actually uh, show you the live environments for both of these and kind of show you um, what you get into each of those. So I'm going to get through all of them and then we're going to go to the live environment. So you can see you got you have a dashboard here um, and then on the left hand column, the menu has changed and you can drill down into all these different pieces of content, right? You've got your followers, which is your demographics and your reach and your page views and your posts and your events and your video like you can just see how you can go crazy with this okay now one little uh important thing on facebook is you can also toggle to date and that is going to be really important moving forward you don't want to just be looking at a week's worth of data it's not actually that useful to be honest because like things change the news changes in the world like looking at little seven week segments of data is I have not found it to be very useful. I like to expand it out 
and now I start to see trends. Okay, so you can toggle here and I'll show you in the live environment. And then we also can export the data, which is, um, let's see, did I put an arrow? I did not, oh yeah, I did, right there, exporting the data. So then you can toggle it and tell it what time. So we're gonna get there, but here's a little primer on where our data actually lives online, okay? Same thing with Twitter, it's got very similar. You have to go to um, analytics.twitter.com. And um, again, I'm gonna show you how to get there from your profile page. And then see, you have a very similar dashboard um, where it breaks it out by month and it tells you kind of like your performance in the last 28 days. Again, when you press tweets, you can break it down by tweet. You can start toggling between date ranges and that's where it starts to get really interesting and useful. <clears throat> on Instagram, unfortunately, it's all mobile, and um, I'm going to show you a little screen recording. You have to actually go to your profile, and there's a little button that says Insights, and this is kind of what you start to see, and you can start drilling down um, to look at different highlights, but again, it's all through, you can't even do this on Instagram on desktop. It has to be mobile, which is really really unfortunate. So you have to be very diligent with this one. Um, and then you can go in post by post and start to see the data um, performance per post. And I'm going to show you how we kind of manage this because it's, um, you know, for Instagram being as big as it is and connected to Facebook, I just, it's kind of inexcusable that you have to do this by phone. But here we, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. It's 2020. And I'd like to have a word with Instagram. If anybody can get me a contact there, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let me actually just show you what this looks like online. Um, hold on, let me make sure I'm showing you the right window. I have a lot of tabs open, folks, a lot of tabs. All right, so here is uh, the Facebook page for UC Davis. And I'm just on our profile page. Um, you can tell that it's trying to serve you some more um, data. I kind of ignore this because I'm like, yeah, that's great, but I don't have context for it. So yay, <laughs> we're not tanking on anything. Um, but what I really want to do is you can say, see all here, or you can also um, visit your insights here. So let's just go ahead and click through and see what happens here. It's going to think for a second. Okay, so here's what we have. This is our page summary for the last seven days. Um, I, folks, I, I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't really pay attention to this. Sally, um, can, you, can you increase the size? Of oh, yes, of the... course. Thank you. Better? Yeah, thank you. Oh, good. Thank you for, thank you, Jeanette. Um, I think I was taking screenshots. That's why it was all small. Um, so you can see, um, you can start to see where you've had bumps um, where you can tell where we've had some um, promotion that grain is paid. You can start to kind of drill down into all of these and they're really pretty good about giving you a description of what each thing um, means. And if you scroll down, you can also see here's my five most recent posts and you can start to see really at a glance like, okay, what is doing really well? And this is where I think personally, it starts to get really interesting um, from a post level. Um, this one just posted yesterday. So it's almost like a little too early to judge how things are going yet. Um, but what I start to look for is I start to ask questions. Like, why is this one so small? And why is this one doing so well? Well, this would happen to be a post about veterinary topics, which always, at, over time, we've noticed continue to do really well for us. Cute animals, vets, happy place, right? Um, we also were, it was a post where one of our vets was on the uh, Kelly and Ryan show, <laughs> so national TV, and there was a tag, and there was a video, and so then you start to understand and see these patterns amongst posts. You're like, okay, I know why that did well, because it was about vet med. Um, it also had national television hook in. Very successful. Look at that. You know, no paid elements, a hundred. Um, and then you can start to actually really start drilling in on what this looks like. So this is just an overview. 
and a glance, you can also start seeing um, where uh, our fans are online. And this one is tricky. You have to take it with a grain of salt, but you can now start seeing, oh my gosh, there's still quite a few people on at midnight, probably me. Um, 3 a.m. it dies down, that makes total sense. 9 a.m., now we get a good push. So when we start to think about, and then this little hump right here in the evening, okay? So we, everybody's community is gonna be different here. So just because this is how it is with UC Davis, you need to go check your own data and see if you start having trends here and you're gonna start seeing patterns over time. So we know on Facebook, um, we don't really post a lot of stuff like on, on Fridays and Saturdays, you see the numbers are dip just a little bit, not, not too much, but we know that in the morning around 9 a.m. or around 8 p.m. is a really good time to post because that's when people are on. And I will tell you, Instagram looks completely different for us. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are the big days for Instagram. That's where people are just like messing around online. So again, these are this is where you start to get those, um, start to get informed on this. I wanna show you one other thing. Um, I wanna show you the export real quick. This is where it starts to get real interesting. Um, you can select your date range. So say you want to look at a bigger chunk of content. You can go back three months. Um, I think you can go back up to 90 days um, and pull big 90 day chunks. It just starts to get a lot to be a lot of data. Um, so you can start pulling this um, so that you can see like what happened last month. Um, let me see. I don't want to... <clears throat> Here we go. Last month. And look, there it is. Page data. Remember, that's the data that's on your page. How many people are coming to your page? Here's your post data, how each post is performing. And then video data, which is also included in post data. But if you really were like very video front heavy, you might want to pull this and take a look at all the little nitty gritty clicks. So if I was to pull that, I'm going to go ahead and export that data. It's going to take a while. And while we're waiting for that to do its thing, we're going to go over to Twitter. So um, here's the Unfold Twitter uh, page profile. Um, and to get to our analytics from our home page on our desktop, just click more. And there's this analytics. I'm sorry if this is also small. I'll go ahead and expand that. And this takes us to our account. And you can quickly see in, in um, October, we've done 25 tweets. We've had 105 profile visits, only 16 new followers, but we've got 35 impressions. So this is like your, your little dashboard. Here's what's doing really well. Um, and then if you want to drill down by post, okay, so that's by like our page data. Here we come to our post data and look, now we can start looking at it one by one. Okay. We really start drilling down again, time period. So good to play around with. And then look, there's that export data by tweet, by post or by day. If you wanted to break it out by day, day by day, which is a little annoying. Um, you can also look at your videos and conversion tracking means like if you have ads um, or if you want to look at links. So you've got engagement data <clears throat> and there's more to just drill down in. So the first step to getting um, really familiar with all of your data is just to go play around in it. Just go peek, go look, go explore, be curious, ask yourself some questions like, you know what I want to know? What the heck happened on this day? right? So go click on it and go see what happened on October 4th. And then you're going to start being able to make um, answer questions, but only if you do it kind of regularly. Let's see if my export. Okay. Look we, what we have another question. I don't know if oh, you yes. want to address that from Suzanne on the chat. Can you see it, Sally? Um, let's see. We found our users are online later than it was pre-pandemic. Is there any way to get IG story data past 14 days? Oh, IG story data, ugh, that is really hard to get past 14 days. There is a tool that we use um, that helps you track IG stories and actually maybe we, um, yeah, we I can show you that, but um, there's no way to get it organically past 14 days. It's a bummer. So we have a tool that allows you to track it and actually is quite affordable if you wanna, um, it's called Mish Guru. Um, okay, so let's get back into our presentation and I'm going to show you a little bit more about what to do with all this data. Okay. 
Um, and yeah, that's a, it's a really good point that um, data has, user behavior has changed since COVID, right? So even though we thought we knew what we were doing this time last year, everything has changed. Time of day, day of week. So these things, just being comfortable knowing how to navigate is going to be really important. Um, so how do you process all of this data? You know, you pull your export or you're looking at it every day. How do you start looking at bigger threads? Um, first, I want everybody to know that social media data is really messy. So you're just going to have to make some decisions about what's important to you and how you want to, what, what is your story that you're trying to tell or what are you trying to solve? What question are you trying to answer? And then just kind of make a decision and then embrace it and move forward with consistency on it. Um, you can go down a rabbit hole really fast and, and it can get very confusing. So sometimes just being decisive, like this is how I'm gonna measure this and then just doing that consistently is gonna be the best um, bet. So I know this is tiny. I know this is really hard and I don't want anybody to freak out or get overwhelmed by this, but this is how we track our data. So we pull all those exports and then we pull key numbers from those exports and we track it month over month. Just goes into a Google Sheet. We've got it rigged up so that we can, it kind of starts automatically working for us. But the reason I'm showing you, you don't need to track all this. Look, we've got 28 channels under our purview. Like you don't need to do this. But what you do need to do is make some decisions about how and what you wanna track and start doing it very consistently. So I will share with you what we track on the regular and it's very tiny, I apologize, but I'm gonna read the top five blue, dark blue columns. Total number of fans across all channels. Okay, so now I can say in 2014, we had you know 200,000 fans. Now we have um, close to 600,000 fans. Whoa, now, now I can show that journey over the last four years to show that we've more than doubled. That's a pretty impactful little nugget, right? Number two, total number of impressions generated across all channels. So to get those numbers, I have to do it by platform, but then I just do the grand total and it starts to look very impressive. In the last, um, this is last year's data, but we generated 85 million impressions with social media data. That's pretty impressive, right? You start to kind of see the scale of it. Um, number three, total, total engagements generated. So just, you know, we don't, if we, we break it down for us, but to report up to leadership, we just show this is how many people like actually engaged with our content. It was 1.6 million last year. Um, total URL clicks. So are we doing our job to like move people over to the website? We can measure clicks. That's a really important measurement. And then the other thing that we do is we actually measure how many pieces of content we produce. So you can see, well, maybe you can't, the numbers are kind of very small. But on that bottom line, I look at how many pieces of content we're creating every month and you can tell where our busy seasons are. And we generate, our team generates close to 3000 pieces of content every year. And this is important because it shows the volume and the work. And if you're doing social media correctly, you're always expanding, you're always moving it forward, right? And so again, you're gonna have to start um, arguing for resources, tools, whatever that is, and this starts to show your growth trends. Okay, so you don't have to be this complicated. I wasn't gonna recreate something simpler because like, honestly, this is how we just use it. So I wanted to show that. But the most important thing here, consistency. We do this every month. We've got it down. We don't, it doesn't actually take us that much time to pull it. Maybe it's like one hour a month. And now we get to start seeing trends. And here's what it starts to let us do. It starts allowing us to extract insights. Okay, and insights are all about asking questions. What are the peaks? What are the valleys? What happened in April that made us do almost 100 more posts than in February? Why? Where did we track? Um, what is happening on the global scale? Because you know what? Global news and big trends has big impact on, on how people are engaging online. Um, what did we learn from the posts that didn't perform well? That, actually, those are the more important posts to look at are the ones that tanked versus the ones that performed extremely well. What irregularities happened month to month? And here's how we start taking that month to month data and tracking it. So we can just look at where we were um, by platform every month and we start to see some big trends. 
So this is last year's data. You can see on LinkedIn, which is the green line, um, <clears throat> school starting and school ending, huge moments for new fans for us. We have reorganized all of our strategy because we're like, oh my gosh, when people come to school, they say that they're coming to UC Davis, that's when they're joining us on LinkedIn. And then when they graduate at the end of the year and going and getting a job, that's when they're also linking us. So when we're doing link, when we're doing strategy around LinkedIn, key periods of time for us, right? Um, you can also see how um, the COVID-19 closure in March and April really impacted um, how people were engaging with us. So you see some spikes in March, but we also had a huge spike on, on Instagram, which is that pink line. So that makes you kind of go, hmm, what happened there? And we had a live tour for new, um, new students and we just walked around campus and it was hugely engaged with on Instagram. Guess what we're doing tomorrow? A live Instagram <laughs> um, campus tour. So we're gonna repeat that success. Um, and that spike is ginormous. I mean, I, I almost didn't believe it when I went and looked at the, when I drilled into the data, but this is, now you can start seeing where things are tracking over time. You can also see our success and the way that the team is structured over time has also had to evolve. So I looked at this year over year. Again, consistency is key, right? Now I have the same data year over year and I can track it. And here you can see um, the dark blue line is um, last year's uh, total impressions over each month. And you can see school start is there's always a bump. Um, there was the campfire in November back two years ago. You can start to see where things are, are trending, right? And look at how crazy, how freaking insane it is from March, like kind of January, all the way to the end of the year, be, given everything that's going on this year. So our volume has just absolutely amped up, which means more reach, more impact, more comments, more things to ma manage and moderate. And look at that teeny tiny little line, which is 2020 21, which is our data over the last couple of months, already at a huge scale. So, again, starting to see trends here. Also, you can start to map trends around how you're engaging with your audience. So, you better believe I brought this graph back to my boss and said, Hey, guess what happened last year? We engaged with people almost double rate because we were answering questions around COVID and campus closure and commencement and we need more help. We need more help, but we're doing our job really well. So take a look at this, right? <clears throat> um, this uh, also looks at engagements that that uh, pink spike here. Again, that was our Instagram tour. <laughs> I mean, just like blew it out of the water. Um, so of course, we're definitely um, re-engaging that. And then this helps us map when the, we have these big trends over the years. So we actually started writing down what things are happening each month. And this is our impact calendar. And actually, we are happy to share this impact calendar with you if that helps you get a leg up. Um, and you can start tracking. And Carla's favorite thing to do is she puts it on her desk. Carla's my colleague. And anytime like a little crisis or something crazy happens, she writes it in. And then we go back and look at that and go, oh, that's why that happened happened in March or April or whatever. Um, and so this, um, but this also helps us look ahead and start planning and understanding what was important in the past and maybe it's going to be important again this year. This also helps us take does it make decisions around channels. What channels are we going to be on? Because you would think maybe that Twitter is maybe the, our most hyperactive community, but look at Facebook. Facebook had a ton of reach but look at Instagram stories and Instagram posts combined overwhelmingly drove most of our reach on all of our channels. So now you got to start seeing a different picture about like, where are you going to spend your time? How are you going to spend your time? And then where, where do you want to like, what content do you want to actually start writing? The other thing that was is interesting is I think we would all love to walk away from Facebook. We, we pulled this metric. This is the number of clicks generated. And um, look at Facebook in March. Okay, do we remember what happened in March? COVID. Everybody wanted to know if campus was closing. Everybody wanted to know what was happening. So while they weren't engaging with us on, on um, like with likes and comments and shares on Facebook, man, they were clicking on it. And you know why? Because those were the parents on Facebook because we matched it with our demographics and now we have more parents on Facebook than we do have students. 
And that's so, so we're like, okay, can't abandon Facebook. There, there she is, gotta stay there, this is why. And this, again, helps us make big strategic decisions. But we wanna get granular too. So every month we pull low performing posts and we pull top performing posts. And we define performing posts by engage that that like little green triangle, right? We're looking at you know where the most shares are, where the most engagements are. And we start to look at them in mass. Okay, so we pull three every month, and then we actually at the end of the year we look at all of the all the low performing posts and all the top performing posts, and we start to look for trends. And I pulled these because I don't know about you, but look at all those visuals. Does anything about that say UC Davis to you? Nah. To me, I think that's a pretty striking trend. Visually, we can say, wow, you know, that lipstick post does not look like, it does not look like it comes from UC Davis at all. Um, that, you know, stock photo, not really working. These are all about a specific um, kind of content. Um, so then you can start pulling some trends and watching it go along. Conversely, look at our top posts. Facebook, it was a great video of, a, of an older gentleman walking across the stage. These are from two years ago, I apologize. Um, unexpected stories. Uh, you start to see either visual trends um, and you can only do this by looking at it together in mass. And then we take all of our learnings, everything that we learn, any like observation that we have, and we put it into what we call our content strategy. So we have learned, <sighs> live moments, live campus tours, gold. Okay, we put that in our Instagram uh, uh, content strategy. Again, I, I apologize, these things are really small. I will share this document with you. Um, so you can you can use it and fill it out on your own as well. And everything that we learned, it just continues to go into this document so that we never, it's not always all up here. It's, it's starting to be written down and you can start to form strategy around it. Okay, I've talked a lot. I'm sure we have questions in the chat. Um, we can, um, I just, there are some tools to help you do this. You don't have to do it all by Excel. You can use Hootsuite. Hootsuite does have great reporting, especially when it comes to top and bottom posts, especially because it can pull Instagram top and bottom posts. Okay. So you don't have to go through on mobile. You can use Hootsuite and you can just quickly say, what are my top posts for the last year? And it'll just bloop, pull them for you. And you can start looking at, conversely, pull your bottom posts. It's actually where you're going to find the most learnings. Um, we have a tool called Brandwatch. We'll get into that, but it can also pull a lot of data for you. Sprout Social um, has some pretty good metrics too. We don't have a contract uh, with Sprout on campus, but it is pretty affordable if that's um, another option. There's Buffer. And then for Instagram stories, which I'm not sure who asked that question, but thank you for asking it. Instagram stories, Facebook stories, and Snapchat, we have a separate tool called Mish Guru, which pulls and historically saves for all time your metrics on that those platforms. Um, it's I think like a thousand dollars a year for a seat, but it is like it's saved us so much time and money because we don't have to pull it and tabulate it, and it's all kind of right there. And then you can also schedule posts through it, so that one's nice. Um, in summary, how's my time? Uh, focus on your key metrics. Stay focused on those. Don't worry about everything else. Invest your time to set it up and then it's going to be a time investment to set it up. But then once you get it set up, it kind of starts to run its own self and maintain it. Be diligent. Use your data to make the case for more resources. I know Linda's seen me do this. I've pulled out big data sheets before. It's probably really annoying, but um, sometimes it can be very helpful. And then just be prepared for constant education in this space. It is changing, it is moving, it is a living, breathing thing. And I will tell you every time I dive in, I learn something new. So, um, but don't be afraid to ask for help. And that's what our team is here for. So that is metrics training in like a real short amount of time period. I'm sure there's more questions. Can we jump into them? It looks like um, there's a question from Karen that we haven't addressed um, okay. about Twitter analytics. Where would you find the times? Oh, um, yes, I think you can find the times um, when you go into tweets, the tweet section. 
um, but go explore and see see what you find. Twitter is harder on times because that community is wild. <laughs> so you're, you, you, Facebook can look at the data a little bit more inclusively because it's just looking at the data of your fans. Um, Twitter can look at your followers, but you also are, you know, there's a, a little bit more of an expansive community there. So I take those with a grain of salt. And Tunya Lee asked about Insta shortcuts. And so did um, Suzanne. She wanted to know, is there a way, well, you already addressed this, to get IG story data past 14 days? Yeah. But you mentioned um, Hootsuite. So is <clears throat> there some? Yeah, so Hootsuite looks at your feed data. So your posts that you post. For Instagram stories, I'm just, I'm really sor sorry to say, I'm not aware of any other option other than Mish Guru. Now I have been in talks with Hootsuite. Um, it sounds like they are working on Instagram story management and hopefully data tracking. So we're hopeful that that will come in the next year for, um, you know, hopefully this year or maybe early 2021. But we do know that they are working on it and that they're, they're making some promising gains. It all has to do with the, the Instagram API. So um, right now we, we have Mish Guru, which can do all of that for you right now. Or if you want to wait, it sounds like Hootsuite is underway with construction around um, Instagram stories specifically. Mm -hmm. And then are you using enterprise level for Mish Guru? Yes, we are. We have a um, UC Davis negotiated contract with them. Um, I believe that it's, uh, I think it's 1250 for, for the year, for a seat for the year. Um, if you're interested in joining, it's really easy. Um, you, besides, I mean, well, okay. If you're interested in joining and have the funding, <laughs> that's the non-easy part, right? The funding part. But if you do have the funding and you want to join on, all it takes is um, sending me a recharge code and um, we can get you on in the next hour. It's that easy. So um, there's but, also a question from Faith Kern, Kern just above that. And you might want to take a look at it. Yeah. It's a two-part question. Okay, yeah. Oh, God. Good one, Faith. Um, okay, so I'm wondering if you could speak to sense of limitations on numbers driven content strategy, particularly in an academic setting and on DEI, um, JEDI related content. Yes, this is so good. Okay, so I don't really have all the answers here, but I will, I'm going to tackle the DEI part first. Um, one of the things that our team is really interested in is doing some metrics audit and setting up some frameworks so we understand how we are doing with the DEI topics and accessibility and um, inclusivity in imagery and um, language use. So while I don't have the answer for you now, what we are trying to do is apply a metric structure to that kind of content to really understand what, where are we lacking? What have we been missing? And how can we improve? Um, I will gladly keep you all up to speed on that discussion, which we're working together with the DEI office on. Um, I'm very excited about it, but I also don't know what it's gonna, what it looks like. I just, how do you, Anyway, there's so many questions there and I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed about that discovery process, but I don't really have anything to share with you other than when we look at our top and bottom posts, we do start to look at like, what have we represented? What have we misrepresented? What are we not representing at all? Um, and we have so much work to do there. Um, on, the at, on the academic side of things, um, I think social media is one part gut and intuition and like art and creativity and the other part is data. So while we do have this numbers driven game, everything is taken with a grain of salt and we still try to follow some intuition or listening to our community and still have room for creativity and fun. Because if it was just numbers and clicks driven, you'd, you'd become this like soulless like thing <laughs> that I see some media outlets and some news driven things become because they're just so driven by those clicks. And what we try to always do is ground ourselves in the community. What's the community need? What's the value that we're bringing to them? And sometimes the answer isn't a click. 
right? It's that's that's self-serving a click. But if I'm helping a person or I'm getting them the resources that they need, or if I'm adding value to the community, then that is actually our measure of success. And it's funny that you say this is that we're actually as a team going to be sitting down and trying to redefine what success looks like for a post. Is it about the clicks? Is it about the engagements? Or can we go one step further and somehow measure how we helped a person? Because that's really what we're, what our job is. You know, it's not about how big we are. It's about the value that we're bringing to our community. So data helps us with some of that. But then you also have to apply that kind of some of that intuition and gut and and other forms of listening. <clears throat> oh my gosh! Ah, okay. Let's see. Um, it's okay if I share screen to receive some live advice on how to navigate Facebook department accounts. Um, we, if I don't know if we'll have time, but I will, I can offline that with you. Um, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do that for anybody. If we, if we need to do any office hours or consultations or anything. And then, oh, I see Linda, you responded to that. Um, see my own less engagement with justice oriented work, right? So, right, like, is that, it's still important to say it. you might not have gotten so many clicks, still important. I, I would argue that that is critical content. Um, what else above, do we have? Above that, Suzanne asked, do you track metrics in regard to driving traffic to your website? We do, we do. We look at URL clicks. That's very specifically. Now we do, you might've heard of the term of dark social. Has anybody heard that? Okay, so dark yeah. social, it's not that mysterious. I don't, I, you don't really need the mysterious fingers. Um, so dark social just means when somebody takes a URL and shares it like in a text message or in a direct chat, you know, with like their mom or something like that. So they're still sharing on social media. They're still sharing something that they've seen on social media. They're just taking it off of that um, and not using the share function where you can track it and they're moving it into a private conversation. And uh, most of our URL traffic from social media actually comes from that. So we can see that from Google Analytics that we have certain amounts coming from social media. And then we can see where we've dropped that link in social media. And this number from Google Analytics will always be higher because there's that dark social element but then we can track where people came direct from a link, you know, on, on Instagram stories or Facebook or wherever. So we're constantly looking at those two numbers, but the one that comes from Google Analytics will always be bigger because of that dark social component. There's a question from Linda. Okay, how much time do you think it will take one person to set up a similar system for their platforms? Most of us, yes, oh God, yeah. <laughs> reality this isn't anybody's full-time job probably but mine um uh it took me a long time to set up the structure however i'm gonna give it all to you so i'm gonna give you the spreadsheets i'm gonna give you the data calculators and all you have to do is export the, your data drop it into the calculator that i've given to you and it will calculate it and then you just put it into your, your master data sheet so hopefully it won't take you too much time because <laughs> the structure hopefully has been outlaid for you. Um, but it will take you a couple hours just to get familiar with it and like go through the process and train yourself where to look and how to drop and did the numbers all match up. And then after that, it's pretty low key. Um, I, I mean, I know I have a lot of practice in it, but I've been able to teach at my team and my interns how to do it and they are so fast at it. So it takes everybody on my team about an hour or an hour and a half each month to do their their own channels. So together, 28 channels, a couple hours each, we've got it all done. So I gladly share that with you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. So yeah, um, yeah if you send it to me, I'll share it with everybody. I will. Yeah. And please don't hesitate to like, if you open it up and you're like, what? Just reach out. Just an email away. Okay. And Linda asked another question at the end of that one mm. about DEI not even strategy. A, it's not really a question. It's just I, I really appreciated Faith's point. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, this is where I want to devote a lot of strategic energy and time. And I'm so 
uh, interested in what peer institutions are doing. I don't know if there's been any discussions around the system. Do they come up at the system-wide social media calls or just, I think that would be great to attack this as a system. Yeah, I, I agree. So um, one of our teammates, she's doing this for undergrad admissions and she's actually getting her master's in it. So this has become wow. part of her thesis, which is amazing. Um, and lucky for us to have her really take the charge on this. And as far as we can tell, no other institution has done this. Okay. Not even in higher ed, we cannot find any, any content online about this. And we've reached wow. out to other um, universities and other government systems, and we just can't find a framework because obviously we'd like to use that work and build off of it. But it sounds like we're going to be kind of doing it on our own, which well, is I, exciting. The, but I, like. I think the extension system is has been tackling this because it, you know it, it's so much more immediate in our work to reach mm -hmm. underserved populations, and um, so we'll have to check around and see what insights we can share from our yes our peers over there. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, there's so much more to do is the answer. And um, yeah, we would love if you'd be interested in that as well. And if we can create something where we can at least start to move forward, knowing it's going to be an imperfect system, but knowing that we can at least start getting some kind of measurements and benchmarks in place so that we understand how to improve. Mm -hmm. So it's really about auditing the work that we've done and setting up a framework with how to measure it. <clears throat> but yeah, there's tons more work to be done. So if you find anything out in the wild, please share. Yeah. And we'll continue to per, um, update you on how those conversations are gonna go. But this is like a, this is like a multi-year, like, yeah. And getting the system involved would be amazing. It's a great point. Yeah. Well, I wanna be respectful of, of everyone's time, but thank you so much, Sally. We've got some kudos in the chat and I think everyone um, definitely had some takeaways. Okay, so, good. Hopefully awesome. not overwhelming. Yeah, great. And yeah. our next meeting um, with this group, the ANR Communicators, is Monday, November 16th at 10 a.m. And Linda, do you want to let us know who is going to be speaking? At that? Yeah, we have Michael Villalobos coming and we're going to be talking about DEI uh, related to in terms of our work as communicators. So I don't really? have I don't have his presentation, so I don't have the specific uh, agenda yet, but I know that he's going to make it partially interactive so that we can share, you know, questions and concerns, and then he'll ground us in some of the best practices for addressing DEI in our communications work. So, Linda, maybe I'll sneak in on that. You should. Yeah, you're welcome to. I might. <laughs> Join our network. Yeah, okay. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. Have a Thank great day. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.